If you just excuse me for just one minute, I want to ask my fellow equestrian, uh, Caitlin, did you bring your Grand Reserve Champion ribbon? Oh, isn't that nice? I'm going to see that after the service. Woo! Caitlin is an equestrian, rides a horse, and did, had a show on Saturday. Yeah, very good. And she won the Grand Champion and the Reserve, and the Reserve Grand Champion and two blue ribbons. Very cool. All right. Thank you. Well, let's give her a hand. It's not a great big horse. It's great. I love seeing that on Facebook. I'm going to follow my blog, and basically what I'm going to do is uh, try and uh, flesh out what the storm is according to the biblical text and what we're supposed to learn from it, kind of what the calm is, and then how we might apply that in our lives, kind of work through um, all four of these texts. So that's the task, I think, and then uh, we'll be singing the, I'll bring up the hymn sometime there towards the end. So let's open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit for a moment of peace that God might speak to our hearts and, and open us to whatever word we might receive. Saying, Amen. Well, as many of you know, I was up in Ohio, uh, first of all, for my mother's 80th birthday, which was just a real joy to be there with mom and dad. And dad's 80th was last year. We were able to be with him. It's just one of those great blessings in life that, you know, um, uh, they can't take for granted. Uh, then I went uh, down to the seminary. I had a, a couple days down there where I trained new supervisors, which is always a gift for me. I've been doing it about six years. I always learn more about kind of my style and what I can do as much as I try and, and help them uh, kind of grow into their, what will be their style of supervision. So that was really a joy. Well, anyway, in the middle of that, um, I had entered a race in Fremont. It's the Fremont 34th Annual Camelback Four Mile Race. And my brother from Chicago entered the race as well. Now the Heinzes, the Heinz men at least, including my father, um, kind of have this pattern of living. We spend probably the first 50 years just ignoring our, you know, our diet or whatever we drink. We just do whatever we want. And then we wake up at like 51 or 2 and go, oh my God, how did this happen? And then we exercise like crazy for the rest of our life. Um, it works for me at least, I don't know. So my brother had started running and it was really great for him because his body build is much even more conducive to heart attacks than mine. And that's our family history. Uh, so he's lost great weight. Uh, and we communicate by a run keeper. It's an app you can get where it tracks you by GPS, tells what your pace is, um, you know, we can, and we're on the same team or competing teams. And I've been running consistently about a minute faster than he has per mile, maybe 45 seconds faster, so I was confident. Um, but um, I trained for uh, 5Ks, which are 3.1 miles, and this was a four mile race. I'm just going to say that up front. And I'd been sick for about two and a half or three weeks with a respiratory issue, so I hadn't been able to run. And on the day of the race, I was having trouble getting a really deep breath. I'm just gonna put that in there right away. <laughs> so anyway, the race starts, I take off like a shot. I'm feeling great, I'm running maybe a seven and a half minute pace. I mean, I really have gone out fast uh, because I'm running a 5K in a four mile race. Just gonna say that one more time. Uh, <laughs> So I'm feeling great, I get to about a mile and a half, and I'm going over a bridge, and suddenly my brother passes me. And I, I'm gonna tell you, right, I was done at that point. Psychologically, I was finished. So now I try and hang with him and realize, you went out too fast, you idiot. Your brother's gonna beat you. So, of course, he did. But I just wanna say, I trained for 5Ks, and I was sick. <laughs> You know, we're always looking for reasons, aren't we? Not just for when things don't go well, but maybe even how we can make sure things go right. We're always looking to explain things. That somehow gives us a certain amount of security. If we understand the system, we know how we can work within the system. And when things don't work according to the system, what we try to do is maintain the system and insist upon the system because something must be able to be controlled. We've got to be able to figure this out. That's what the story of Job is about. It's not a true story, except that it's true for all of us. We all live in Job's world one time or another. It's more than true. It sets up this question. Why do bad things happen to good people? And so for all the chapters that lead up to the one that we read, chapter 38, that's the question that's being pushed and pulled on. 
Job insists that he has not done anything to deserve what happens to him. He's holding on to his understanding. I'm a righteous man. I sacrifice not only for myself, but for others. Therefore, this should not be happening to me. So I'm going to have my day in court, and I'm going to demand to know, God, why did you kill my family, destroy my house, take away my wealth, and now destroy my health? His friends also agree with that system. But what they say is, Job, you did something because bad things are happening to you. Therefore, you must have done something wrong. His wife only speaks once in the second chapter. She says, listen, just curse God and die because I'm sick and tired of your complaining. She hasn't even gotten into the next 34 chapters. So for all those chapters, his friends come at him relentlessly, trying to maintain the system. Job protests his innocence, relentlessly complaining, maintaining the system. And after all the silence of those 34 or so chapters, God finally speaks out of a whirlwind. Where were you? When I established the foundations of the earth, where were you? When I called up the mountains out of the deep, where were you? When I cast the stars into the heavens and the angels laughed for the sport of it, where were you? When I told the ocean, stop, no mount farther will you go. Now, that sounds like bad news for Job. It sounds like God is even more cruel than we can imagine. Not only does he take everything away from Job, now he attacks Job. But the truth is what God is doing is giving Job a way out of the box, a way out of the system that clearly doesn't work, so that finally Job understands in a way he didn't before. And what he says to God I've spoken of things too great for me to understand. And he repents, not of something he does, but of the system. He lets it go. And he's willing to live in radical trust that whatever's going on in the world, he can't figure it out. Therefore, I will live trusting that you were there when the foundations were laid. I will live trusting that you were there when you called the mountains out of the deep. You were there when you cast the stars of the heaven. You were there. And you are here speaking to me, even if, if it is out of a whirlwind. So that's what the men in the ocean come to understand, these sailors in Psalm 107. Although it's part of a longer psalm, that talks about humans rebelling against the ways of the Lord, of trying to go their own way, control their own destiny, and not give God God's due. And so they go out into the oceans, and then a, a mighty wind rises, and the waves mount. I remember, whenever I read this text, I always remember when I was 11 years old, crossing the North Atlantic in September, on the SS United States. It was an ocean liner five city blocks long, and we ran into one of those late fall, early fall storms. I remember standing on the observation deck and watching the bow of this mighty ship go down, 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 disappear into the ocean, and then come back up again, and then go down, 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 and then come back up again. It was the most magnificent and terrifying moment of my life. Their skills were of no avail. They reeled and staggered as if drunk. Their skills were of no avail. They could not control the wind, the waves, the thunder, the lightning. They were at the mercy of the elements. So what do they do? They cry out to the Lord in their distress. Haven't you found yourself at a place in life where your skills are of no avail. You do everything you can possibly do. You try and make the system somehow fit this new paradigm. And then you come to understand, it's out of my control. 
I can't do anything else. It may be in your relationships, maybe in seeking out gainful employment that's not just a paycheck, but something meaningful. It may be those children, youth who have forgotten that they are your life, so they treat theirs with contempt. The truth is, your skills are of no avail. Therefore, God gives you a way out of the system to lay your very lives on the mercy of God and accept life in all its dimensions as not being devoid of God's presence. The Apostle Paul encourages the Corinthians in the storm of conflict. I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, I follow Paul, I follow Christ. To not accept the grace of God in vain. That is, they understand the mercy of God for themselves. They deny it to everyone else. Therefore, they have accepted that grace in vain. It doesn't change them. They are still mired in the past in the ways of pride and envy. They are rude and arrogant and boastful. If they're captured by grace, they're patient, kind, long-suffering, always thinking the best of others. Now is the time of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. I've heard you. What does that mean? It means when grace captures you, when it sparks your imagination, you no longer remain mired in the past. It is as if you could reach out and pull the future down into your present. That no matter what happens to you, you have more peace, more joy, more grace, more love, more understanding, more, in that sense, security. That you are loved beyond measure, therefore you can love in the same way. So the world might hear this. I've heard you. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Live that future in the present. Because God has entered so fully into our reality to wear our flesh, not as a garment he could take off and bring to the cleaners and then put back on. No, the one who established the foundation of the earth, who called up the mountains from the deep, who cast the stars into the heaven, becomes as we are. Nowhere is that more clear than in this gospel text. It's got a strange little line that's not included in Matthew or Luke. It says that while Jesus was the one who decided to go across the other side, it was the disciples who took him just as he was into the boat. What in the world does that mean? Well, let me offer this. What we've read just before this in chapters 2 and 3, and that most of chapter 4, that Jesus has been shutting up demons who have outed him as the Son of God, even while the Pharisees accuse him of being in league with the devil. He's surrounded by crowds pressing in on him, all wanting to touch him, to be healed by him. He's being debated by people, and he's teaching all day long in the hot sun to crowds that just don't understand the parables you're telling. He is exhausted, and I'm going to suggest that he's already fallen asleep on the shore. The disciples pick up their Lord and Master and carry him to the boat and put him in the stern and set out to the other side. He is sleeping the sleep of the dead, so exhausted that even the wind and the waves, the thunder, the lightning, nothing will wake him up because he doesn't wear our flesh like a garment. He inhabits it. He is tired, beyond tired. They have to rouse him roughly, push on him, slap him. And then what do they say? Do they say, Lord, save us? No. To add insult to injury, they ask, don't you care? I've been there. When storms are overwhelming, when all my skills are to no avail. 
when I want to know why the system no longer works? Don't you care? And then in those moments, like this story, God stills the storm, speaks softly and tenderly so that we might be embraced by love beyond our ability to comprehend. We might live more fully into the gift that is grace. Faith says, no matter what happens to me, especially when I can't figure it out, I will trust that you already have, <laughs> that you already have, that I don't have to worry about a thing, that I'm already celebrating the future feast of victory. I'm already there, therefore I'm going to live more radically in my present. No more uh, evident of that. And then the last words of these hymns, and I'll finish with this. So it's a difficult hymn because it speaks clearly about the things we struggle with especially when those we love are fading away in our very sight. But it's filled with hope in the Lord and the day of salvation. So the last verse goes like this. Within your spirit, goodness lives unfading. The past and future mingle into one. All joys remain unshadowed, light pervading. No value deed will ever be undone. Your mind enfolds all finite acts and offerings held in your heart. Our deathless life is one. Give up the system. It doesn't work. Live into this truth. We often speak of things too great for us to understand. But God knows everything. And our deathless life has been won by Jesus Christ, who didn't just wear flesh like a garment, but an inhabitant fully, so that the disciples took him just as he was when they removed the nails and carried him to the tomb. Trust him, maybe, that in three days they'd see him again. To that God, your glory, honor, and praise.